in the uh, the chat. Oh, yeah. oh and it's never mind. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, this is Sarah with the book club on the effect book. We're in chapter 13 right now. And this is the second session because chapter 13 is just super long. Um, and chapter 13 is about regressions. So it's mostly a repetition of stuff that we already know, but it's kind of good to just get in there and see how things connect because like the author, I feel like he's really understood stuff so he can show connections that in my head weren't there before. Um, so last week we did, um, we just did a repetition of some basics. We had a look at the error terms at some assumptions and then looked at how to read regression tables and how to get from a DAG to a regression. And the, today we're going to talk about how to change variables. And then I don't know how far we'll get. Um, so this subchapter is get called Getting Fancier. So we're not just in a very simple OLS, but we're trying to like um, inter or like implement some stuff uh, where um, the data is just not as easy as in a straight OLS. Um, so we're going to look at like binary or discrete variables, um, how to use polynomials, what to do about variable interaction uh, transformations, like how we can transform variables and what might make the most sense, and then have a look at interactions. And like um, interrupt me at any time, Ashley, if there's like something you want to add. Um, so this is very basic. If we have a binary or a discrete variable, let's let's start with a binary variable. So something like a treatment dummy, then basically we always leave one out. So we don't include a variable for something being treated and a variable for something not being treated because then we have perfect linearity and that just doesn't work. And so we just always leave one out. And then the interpretation for a binary variable is just if we switch from zero to one, the coefficient is going to tell us the difference in the dependent variable. And if we have discrete variables, something like religion or sex, sometimes, I don't know, it gets difficult uh, when we have a very small part of the sample that, that um, decides for non-binary. Um, but yeah, I think religion or party affiliation outside of the US is something that's uh, a common example for a discrete variable. And then we do the same thing as for the binary variable, we leave one out and just create a bunch of dummies that we then add. Um, and there the interpretation is the same. It's just that um, it's always in relation to the one category that we left out. So for example, for the religion one, if we leave out Catholic, then, and then we have a coefficient for being Protestant, then that's the difference between uh, being a, uh, a Catholic and being a Protestant. And then obviously the coefficients are going to change depending on which variable we leave out. And if we want to check if this variable is significant, we can just check out one of those dummy variables and their um, significance because it's all together, right? So that's why for that we need a joint def test which personally I've never done. So th that was a good point. Uh, then the next thing is another way that variables can be nonlinear is that we have to use polynomials for them. So this illustration was in the book and it just basically shows us that these variables or this these two variables, they're correlated in a nonlinear way. And this looks very much like an inverted or a U shape. So it's probably sufficient to add something that's quadratic. And we can see that if we if we do that, then this, this shape is much more closely related to the dots that we have. Um, and the important thing to keep in mind here is that we always have to add um, all of the polynomials. So if we want to add an X squared, we have to keep the X. If Oh, this should be a X cubed, sorry about that. But so if we, we always have to include the, the powers that are less than the highest one. Um, and, and this makes it a bit more difficult because then we have to interpret them together as marginal effects. So basically we take the derivative. 
So this is the marginal effect in this case would be beta one plus um, two beta two plus three beta three. Um, and it's, it's not always easy to choose the right number of polynomials. So, okay, here we don't have a legend, but basically this is fitting the data with an increasing number of polynomials. And we can see that just a straight line probably doesn't do it justice. And then we have this not so super squiggly line that seems to be okay. And then we have this thing that just goes up at the end. So that's probably overfitting and probably won't do so great in other contexts. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that it gets harder to interpret as we add more polynomials. And yeah, if you go beyond something that's cubic, the higher order polynomial terms don't really add anything to the R squared. Um, so usually it's okay to leave them out. Um, and, and one way to do this, to, to check out if we still need to go higher, if for example, the x squared is not high enough, then we can just check out our um, x uh, variable versus the residual. So this is what we can see here. We already have like a regression of just x on y. And when we take the residuals and we can see that this is not, randomly distributed. There still seems to be an inverse U shape here. Um, so then we add the X squared to our original regression, and then we can see that we, we don't see anything anymore here. This just seems to be random. Yeah, um, sorry, this is actually the check out the residuals versus X plot. We could also go and just check out the Y X plot, which would be something like here, where we are like, okay, so this cannot be linear. And then a third approach would be to, to use a lasso. Um, so to um, estimate a lasso with like x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth and so on, and then see where a lasso starts kicking um, coefficients out. Okay. So, then another way where we can think about like how, how do we deal with nonlinearity um, is to transform the original variables that we have. Um, so yeah, this is two times one. Okay, anyway. Um, sometimes our variables are super skewed, for example, and that just makes things difficult because some assumptions are not really met that we kind of wanted. Um, yeah, or we just don't have a linear relationship between variables. So for example, um, something like this, where um, we just have something that's mul multiplied. And if we then take the logarithm of that, we, we suddenly get back into the li linear world, which is just easy, or that's the only way we can actually estimate this with OLS. Um, yeah, so those are the two reasons. Either we want our variable to behave nicely, or we think that the relationship is nonlinear and we want to get it back to being linear. And there's a couple of options. And I think the most widely used one is log because it, it just makes the variables look nicer. If we have something that's super skewed and we log it, usually it gets more into this somewhat um, normal distribution. But the problem is that it can't handle zeros. Um, and if we have data where there's any zeros or negative numbers, we, we can't use it. And, and one way to deal with this is to just add one or 0 0.00001 to the variable that we have, but it's, it's not a perfect approach. Um, another way is to use the square root because that can handle zeros but it doesn't do the same thing as adding, um, as, as using a log does because the data are still very much spread out whereas the log just squishes it more together. Then there's the asymptotic inverse something. I always forget. Um, let me check.
inverse hyperbolic sine transformation. Um, and it's very similar to the log, just that it looks different. It does different stuff. Um, but it, it plays very nicely with zeros. Um, we can still interpret it easily enough. So like it's very closely related to how we interpret a log. So if it's like in, in small changes, we can kind of interpret it as uh, percentages. So I mean, I'm not saying that the author really recommended anything, but I think this is the closest to a recommendation that he gives. And another option that's widely used in, in finance is winterizing. So basically we just cut off extremes. So we go to the top 5% and we're like, yeah, no, this is too high. We're gonna give this the value of the, the next lowest um, observation. So we go from one to 5% and we give that the sixth percentile value. And we go to the 95th to 100th percentile and we do the exact same thing there. So give them the 96th percentile um, value, which apparently in finance works well, but again, you're losing, you're losing observations, you're using variance. So I don't know if that's always the best case. And then the last one that he mentions, but I honestly haven't seen this so much in practice is standardizing. Um, where you're just dividing something by uh, the standard deviation. And before that, you, you uh, subtract the mean from it. And you know, I already talked about this briefly, but people like the log because it's easy to interpret, at least when the values are somewhat small. So if they go up to 0.1, um, there's an approximation where basically you can just take the beta one coefficient, multiply that by 100%, and that's gonna be your increase. So if your beta one is like 0 0.03, no, 0 0.03, then you have like, a, if your, um, sorry, if your variable goes up at one unit, then you have a 3% increase in, in the dependent variable. So this just plays very nicely when you want to actually interpret something. Then the next thing that the author talks about is interaction terms. So up until here, we we looked at stuff where the variable itself has a nonlinear relationship with the dependent variable. So just one variable. And like we have those polynomials where we add another variable, but it's just like the same variable, but squared or cubed or whatever. Um, but in some in some cases, it makes sense to interact to uh, independent variables. Um, for example, if we think about how the weather um, affects whether people go outside on the weekends, and we want to include something like the temperature and whether it rains. Um, it might make sense to actually interact those because um, people might be more likely to go outside when it snows, but they might not be so likely to go outside when it rains and it's just icky outside. Um, so if we do an interaction term, we should always include both terms. It's kind of the same as with the polynomials. Um, and I, I knew that, but it was very useful to, to read why we should be doing this. Because if we don't include it, the coefficient that of our uh, interaction term, it accounts not only for the interaction between the two, but it also includes the direct effect of both of them, which is not what we want to have. So especially if we're mostly interested in x and x times z, but not so much z, then we don't have the estimate that we actually want to have. Mm. So this is just an example of an interaction regression thing. Um, this is restaurants and they get health inspections in the US um, and they can be chains, which is why there's this uh, variable in a number of locations. Uh, the weekend variable says when the inspection is gonna be. Um, then we, and then we have the year of inspection and that's, that's it. Um, so here we can see that uh, we added an interaction for the number of locations 
times a year of inspection. So maybe there's just something going on because chains are growing or something like that. Um, and we can also see that this is significant. Don't really know. Yeah, you'd have to interpret that as a marginal effect in combination with the number of locations, which is negative before. Yeah, not sure. Um, and then there's just a random interaction where we're like, okay, maybe it makes a difference if it's a large chain and then it's um, checked out on the weekend and there's not a significant correlation there. Okay. Um, and the author advises us to think very carefully about why we're including a interaction term. Because if we just interact a lot of things, then we just have a lot of coefficients and eventually something is going to turn positive uh, or uh, turn significant. Um, so it, as always, it makes sense to like think first, why, what do we think the data generating process is and to only then include the interaction. Um, because otherwise we have false positives and, and then we try to make a prediction that just doesn't work for, for other um, samples. And also he said to be skeptical of an effect when it's only there for part of the sample. So for example, if our interaction is our treatment and then times religion, and then we can see that the treatment is only there for Catholics, but not for Protestants and so on. Um, and there's also not an effect just on treatment, only when we inject it with something, with somebody being Catholic, then we should really be skeptical because usually the effect should show up even without the interaction. Yeah, and that this, this is really the, just the same again. So like, make sure your story checks out before you go on to the regression. Okay. So this was all about like transforming variables. Now we're going on to changing the whole way that we um, that we model something. Up until now, it was all linear with an OS regression, um, but sometimes those just don't make a lot of sense. Um, so we can see an example here where we have a binary dependent variable, y, and this um, dashed line is the OS prediction, and the other one is a nonlinear regression on logit. And we can see two things here. One is that the range of the OS prediction is just wrong because we can get stuff that's below zero and stuff that's above one. So that's just an issue because the Y doesn't go below zero or above one. And the other one is that the slope is just wrong. So it doesn't, it doesn't change ever. Whereas in some cases it makes sense that it should change at some point of time. Um, so there's there's a couple of different ways that we can model nonlinear relationships, and they're usually tailored to the dependent variable. Um, so whether it's a binary one, for example, or a categorical one, um, that just makes a difference. Um, with a binary dependent variable, actually, you you can do this. So this line that we see, and then it's called linear probability model which again is a bit problematic because the probability can go, go below uh, above 100% or below 0%. Um, but at least we, we get an approach. It's something. Um, and, but if we actually want to model something that is nonlinear, um, we could go with a generalized linear model, which looks from the, from the form here, it, it looks, very similar to the OLS with our index right here. So the beta zero, that, that looks exactly like in the OLS. Um, but we have a function around it and this function is called a link function and that just makes it nonlinear. So thinking about those link functions, there's a couple of things that they need to do, which OLS doesn't do. So where we actually have a um, where it's actually better to, um, to go to the link function. And the one thing is that it should take any value from negative infinity to infinity. 
and the output should be values between zero and one. As the input increases, the output should also increase, so it should go in the opposite direction. Um, and that's about it. Like, there's a lot of different functions that um, satisfy all of these needs. Um, but very popular functions are logit and probit. There's also tobit, um, but really, when you choose one of those two, you should be fine. And there's usually not a lot of difference between taking a logit or a probit model. So both of those are fine. So how, how do we interpret those? Like how do we interpret this slope that's squiggly right here? Um, we use marginal effects because the thing is that the slope is different at every point of X. So we, we need to make sure that we take care of that. Um, and the marginal effects is like in the, in the um, interaction terms for polynomials, um, we just take the derivative. Wait, that's actually wrong, sorry. <laughs> uh, the marginal effects is um, just the probability that y is gonna be one times the inverse of that, or no, not the inverse of that, minus, one minus that. And it changes with every x as it should, um, but that makes it difficult to like show one um, single coefficient for the marginal effect. Um, and one way that this is often countered is by just taking the marginal effect at the mean. So for example, taking the marginal effect right here, which I'm guessing is the mean, something around here. Um, but the author cautions against that and says to use the average marginal effect. So we go through each and every data point right here that we have for x, and then we calculate the, the marginal effect right there, and then we go all over those and take the mean of that, and then we get more of a representative measure. And that's, yeah, that's basically it. Next up is standard errors and how we can mess them up and how we can deal with messing them up because there's a lot of different ways for both of those, like both for messing them up and like not meeting one of the assumptions and for dealing with them. And this is just part of it in the most often things, but there's obviously a lot more than that. Um, the, the problem with standard errors that are not how we think they should be is that they change the sampling distribution so the mean is swingier, so it just goes around more than we think it would, and the standard deviation is larger. And that directly affects whether we think something is significant or not. So let's check out the assumptions first. One is that the error term epsilon is normally distributed, but that's actually not that bad if this is violated. And the author doesn't go into this at all because apparently OLS just is okay with that. Um, the other assumption is that the error term is independent and identically distributed. Um, and the OLS is not okay if this is um, if this is violated. Let me just check in the book real quick. Um, Um, so I just pulled this up because I always get a bit confused on this. So for the error term being independent, that means that it's unrelated to the error terms of other observations. Um, and it also needs to be in, unrelated to other variables for the same observation. So the, the second part is basically heteroscedasticity. And the first part would be something like clustering or so, I would say. So another way in which this, um, this IID assumption can be um, violated if we have autocorrelation we have that in, in finance a lot, I think, you no, know, no, don't have it here. Um, this would be temporal autocorrelation, right? When 
um, the, the value from yesterday is a good predictor for the value of today, then we just have temporal correlation, autocorrelation that just makes it a lot easier to work with. And um, we can also have spatial autocorrelation. So if one county being next to the other um, means that both of those are heavily correlated, um, and then we can take care of that. Another issue is heteroscedasticity, which is probably everybody's, every statistician's favorite word because it sounds so fancy and it takes so long to practice how to actually pronounce it. Um, let me check if I have a photo of this, yeah. Um, so it's just basically that the error term or this uh, that the variance of the error term becomes larger. Um, so one example of this is that uh, is fitness, a self-reported fitness level. So if we go around and ask people, hey, how much do you work out? Then probably the fittest people are going to be the most accurate because they're like, yeah, sure, I can, I can tell you that I work out 10 hours a week. But those people on the other end of the scale, they're like, oh, yeah, usually I don't really work out. But I'm still going to say that I work out two hours per week because that just sounds better. So then we have a, a different um, distribution of the, of the error. And, and that would skew our results. And the nice thing about this is that as long as we know how our error terms are not IID, we can deal with them. So we, we need to find out why they are correlated with something that it shouldn't be correlated with, um, or, or we need to figure out what it's correlated with. But as soon as we know that, we can deal with it. And this is just a list of different fixes. And if we have heteroscedasticity, which we have a lot of the time, then there's the Huber-White uh, standard errors. And we've, we have autocorrelation. Usually you also have heteroscedasticity um, because if the errors are large at some point of time, then tomorrow they're probably still gonna be very large. And the day after that, they're still gonna be very large, but at some point of time, they're gonna be small again. And then the day after that, they're going to be small again and again and again. And so we, again, have heteroscedasticity. It's just kind of implied with autocorrelation. So there's the, I don't really know how to pronounce it. I think I always pronounce it hack standard errors. Um, but it stands for heteroscedasticity and autocorrelation standard errors. And I think the most common one is new US standard errors. Then we have geographic correlation. We can just use commonly spatial standard errors. Um, if we have a hierarchical structure, so say, I think in the book you talked about distributing laptops um, to schools and then deciding or, or the treatment level is a classroom. So classroom A gets uh, the laptops and classroom B does not get the standard errors, uh, get the standard errors, get the laptop. And then it makes sense to cluster on that level. Um, and those are called clustered standard errors, where we take into account that the treatment level is just at a specific level. And apparently the most common ones are Liang Zenger standard errors. And the, the problem with clustering and this hierarchical structure is that you really need to know where you want to cluster, because if you go too high, it doesn't make sense anymore. If you go too low, also doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so one way is if you have a clear treatment, then you just go to the treatment level with this laptop example. We know, okay, the laptops are distributed at the classroom level, so we're just going to cluster at the classroom level. Or the other way it would be domain knowledge, which in other words means going into the literature, seeing what other people do, and then just doing that. The problem with clustering is that it only works for a large number of clusters. So for example, or round about more than 50. So say we only have 20 classrooms and 10 of them are being treated, then we have an issue. And this issue can be fixed with so-called wild cluster bootstrap standard errors. Um, I know there's an R package for this. I don't know about other languages. And then just generally speaking, we can use bootstrap standard errors in, in specific cases. And this is kind of magic. Um, basically, it, it's called bootstrapping because we're using the same sample over and over again. And we're just drawing with replacement from this. 
So we have one sample, but we're making 10,000 samples out of this. Um, and then with each of these samples, we estimate the statistic that we want. Usually that's our um, coefficient standard error. Repeat that, and then we look at the distribution of the estimate. So I think in some earlier chapter, we looked at the uh, a drawing a lot of means, and then that becomes some sort of distribution, and we can do this exact same thing right here. Um, and the nice thing about bootstrapping is that we can use it for a standard error, sure, but we can also use it for any other statistic that we want to. The problem, though, is that we need large samples. Um, and it doesn't work for form well with extreme value distributions. So if we look for something like rain, for example, or precipitation, where we have like some really, really stark extremes, doesn't work so well with that. And it also does not do well with autocorrelation. So this is nice, but it can only be used in some settings. Yes, yeah, so I'm wondering if we have like clusters and autocorrelation and only small number of clusters. Uh, it just gets tough. Um, okay. Do you is there is there anything you would want to add to standard errors? No, I think you covered it very well. But yeah, when you have like clustering few clusters and autocorrelation, it does get tricky. Yeah. Have you have you dealt with that before? Um not with like linear models, but yes, basically every all the data that I work with is like that. Um because I work with um growth modeling of different individual like all all have a whole bunch of individuals of a species, for example. And so like the clustering will be uh, at the individual level because I have longitudinal data. Um, then it'll be at the sex level because usually males are different from females in their growth pattern. Um, and then depending on the granularity of the data that I have, it could be at like the population level and all of that stuff. And then of course, everything is autocorrelated because um, it's growth. How much you how much you weigh at T plus one is, is always related to how much you weigh at T. So. So do you sometimes also just use the change or something like that? I know that in, in econ, they do that. Uh, no, I mean, normally I just use like, um, like mixed effects, nonlinear. Mm -hmm progression um I mean part part of why I wanted to read this book is to try to think of like alternative ways to deal with those data but the standard is just like mixed effects nonlinear regression um um yeah I don't know I don't have anything helpful <laughs> to say unfortunately I think it's still helpful I just need to get my charger real quick um yeah right here So there's, I think we're actually gonna get finished today. It's kind of nice. Um, oh, oh, this is not work. Okay, um, let me just, sorry, this is uh, not how I wanted it. Um, I'm just gonna try and fix the, Um, 
Okay, it's better. Okay, um, so the next one is still about a complete a different thing, and it's about sample weights. Um, because sometimes our, or most of the time, our sample is not going to be a complete dr randomly draw of the population, and there's there's two cases. One case is where we have these really cool surveys where the people who made these surveys know about that, and they add weights that we can just use. Um, and the other use case is aggregated data where we, yeah, where we still have to deal with this. Um, and the procedure with which we can address this is called weighted least squares. So just basically we add another term in our regression, um, which is just a weight for every single observation. Um, so in surveys, for example, they know that they um, survey at 70% females, 30% males, but they know that in the population it's about 50-50, so they're going to be like, okay, let's weight this by something. Or, um, for example, that some states are just going to be overrepresented um, because some people are just going to be harder to reach than others. Um, so yeah, with surveys, this is actually quite nice. We just um, weight it by the inverse of the power probability to be included, and then we add that as weight, and that's it. Um, and the other option where we need um, these weights are aggregated data. If we go back to this classroom example, um, we may have a classroom that's got like 35 students and we may have a classroom that's only got like 10 students. Um, so the variation is going to differ between those two groups. Um, and also just them being larger should be accounted for in some way. Um, and there's two ways to account for this, and that's frequency weighting and inverse variance weighting. Um, and the estimate of both of those is going to be exactly the same, but the standard errors differ. So that's why we need to have a look at both of those. So frequency weighting is if we have exactly the same observation and it's just repeated 50 times, 100 times, whatever the weight is going to be. Um, and the other causes a collection of independent, completely identical observations. So just for example, if we have a binary variable and there's just 50 people choose one and 50 people choose zero, then we have a collection of independent and completely identical observations. And then this is fine to use. However, most of the times it's not gonna be the case. Um, but we, if we have this, uh, there's, there's not really an implemented procedure for this in R. So, we just replicate each of the observations, the number of times that we wanted to weigh it, kind of. Um, yeah, and that's that's just how we do it. Um, the other option is inverse variance weighting. And this is what we do when we have aggregated data. For example, those classrooms that we were talking about. And then that in each aggregate observation is just numbered, uh, is weighted by the number of observations. So in this classroom example, if we have 25 students, it would be weighted by 25. If we have a classroom that's got 15 students, it would be weighted by 15 and so on. Um, and then the, yeah, as I said, the standard are gonna be a bit different than, than they are for the quick frequency weighting. Um, and then another application that he doesn't really go into uh, deeply is meta-analysis, and apparently you can use it for that as well. So when you have a lot of studies that study exactly the same thing, but they have different samples, then you can use it in that context. I don't know, have you ever done that? No. Okay. So another jump, another issue that we can have with our data is that we have collinearity. So basically two variables are very, very closely related to each other. 
Um, and I think this can happen, as the other says, when you have multiple measures of the same concept. So something like intelligence or weather or um, economic development or I don't know, those are the, the variables that I can think of. But I think there's a lot of different uh, concepts where it's like one latent variable and you can measure it in a lot of different ways. Um, and I think some people just add everything and then you hope that the model will let them interact and complement with each other. Um, but the problem with this is that it forces each of them to show the effect of the variation that they have that's unrelated to the other ones. So for example, if we have two intelligence measures, then each of them is just gonna show the part that is not related to the other one. And that's kind of not really what we want. Um, and the problem with this is that we are driving our standard errors upwards. So actually we might have something significant, but because we added too much, it's not significant. Um, so one way to, to deal with this is just to reduce the dimension. So for example, if we're measuring intelligence, we're just going to try and take those five measures and then put them into one um, through a principal component analysis or a latent factor analysis. And I think there's also other ways to do this. Um, another way to address this is to use the variance inflation factor. Um, where we're just checking out for every single one of the uh, of the coefficients how much they explain other coefficients, and then if this is too high, we exclude them. So there's a rule of thumb where this should be larger than ten or larger than five, but yeah, I think there's room for speculation and room for like say, trying both of them. Um. And I think another way to, to address this is lasso. So like throwing all of these um, variables into a lasso and then seeing which one sticks. Um, yeah. I don't know, how, how do you guys, I, mean, I don't know, how do, do you have variables that are super closely related but that you still want to include both of them? Um, most of the way that this will come into effect is usually, um, it's not so much directly because it's not that we're necessarily trying to measure one, one latent variable with a number of different variables, um, but body size is a big one that we have to deal with where pretty much every, um, Every metric, like if you measure a skeleton, for example, all of them are going to be related to body size in some way. Um, but sometimes what we're interested in knowing is like how the shape of a bone differs between two different species outside of the difference in body size. So um, we'll often use something like PCA to, mm -hmm. to deal with that by... Um, you run a PCA and then usually the first principal component is very, very, very strongly driven by body size. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can kind of use that to help deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Do you have a package that you'd recommend for PCA? Uh, we usually use, uh, I want to say we usually use vegan. Um, find it. I'll put it in the chat. Um, it's just a, it's a package that's used for used by a lot of uh, ecologists. <laughs> yeah, because I, I actually have an analysis right now where I'm trying to measure the weather and mm. or good weather as it's perceived by people, which is not so easy to measure. So right now I just put in all of the variables that I could find like rainfall and sunshine and stuff like that. And then I read this and I was like, okay, maybe this is not the best approach. Um, so I wanted to try PCA. Yeah, okay, maybe it's not vegan that we're usually using. We're using vegan a lot with PCA results, but not to run the actual PCA. I will find it because I, I have I have our analyses somewhere that you sit <laughs> I'll find it and I'll send it to you for sure. 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, looking at the time, I'll just go through the last two chapters. Um, another issue that we have with our data is measurement error. So this is a, a different level of problem that we can have with our data, but it's still a problem. Um, and I mean, we just talked about latent variables. This often happens so when we have it when we want a proxy um, because we can't actually measure the variable. Um, but th th there's another possibility and that's that the people who measured something actually just measured it wrong. So that you're measuring the size of fifth graders height, sorry, in that something there is just messed up. Um, yeah, both of those are not great. Um, but I mean, if it's actually a measurement error and it, at least it's consistent, then it's still fine. Um, and then the author groups measurement errors into two different measurement errors. And the first one is a classical one, where if we think about the measurement error like this, where we just have our X star, which is like the latent variable that we want, and then some random error that's added to that. In the classical one, this error term is unrelated to the latent variable. So it's really just noise. Um, and this leads to so-called attenuation so that our um, coefficient that we are measuring, it seems to be closer to zero than it should be. Um, and this is not really a problem because then we can say, oh, this is just a lower bound, but we still found something significant. Um, so we should be good. Um, and if it's in the dependent variable, this measurement error, that's actually not a problem um, because it's just more stuff in the error term of our of our OS or whichever regression model we're trying to use. The real problem shows up when we have a non-classical measurement error, and that means that the error term is related to the latent variable. Um, and here again, we have the self-reported exercising. Um, so that there's just more measurement error going on there. Um, and the author doesn't really address, uh, go into how to address this. He just puts up a couple of, um, a couple of things that you can put into Google and then check them out. Um, but one thing that I found interesting is that you can use instrumental variables in this case, but like not in a causal way but to use one measurement as an instrument for another. So for example, if we have two thermometers in one big house um, and they both measure something different, um, then we can use one of those thermometer measures to um, instrument the other thermometer measure and then use that um, to, to try and get rid of the um, error. Yeah. Ah, just so, thank you. It's gonna be interesting. Um, yeah, do, do you have anything to add? Do you, what, what do you guys do about measurement errors? I mean, you actually have like stuff that you do measure, right? Yeah. Um, honestly, it's probably not dealt with as much as it should be. Um, <laughs> Which is tough, it's not really there. Um, but uh, I mean, a lot of the time we'll check like inter-observer measurement error, especially if you have multiple people on a project. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the nice thing about uh, a lot of our measurements is that usually we'll like, you know, you'll be using calipers, which are, you know, have, have been tested for their um, accuracy and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, it's definitely a big problem that is uh, probably not dealt with enough. <laughs> um, something that I'm interested in exploring a little bit, but haven't really done. Yeah, I get it. And also, like, I mean, half of this chapter is basically, oh, don't worry about it. Like, it might yeah. be a problem, but let's just interpret it as not being a problem. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of times this is not really addressed. You just hope that it goes away. Yeah. Okay. 
just one last slide before we end here. Um, and that's penalized regression, where if we have too many coefficients that we want to put in, this is a way of figuring out which we can drop. Um, so this is kind of where the lasso stuff comes from. Um, so basically, we, we have something that looks very similar to our OLS, um, where, we're, where we have this squared here, and we're trying to minimize that. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to minimize this thing right here as well. And that's a function of all of our coefficients. Um, yeah, and we just try to make that as small as possible. Um, and one of these implementations is lasso. Apparently there's also the rich regression and the elastic nest regression where you combine those two. Um, and then the way you go about this is you do the lasso thing, and then we go back to our causal stuff, right? So we throw out the variables that lasso things that are unimportant, but we still keep them if they close the back door. So even if lasso is like, yeah, no, you don't use this. Um, if in a DAG it makes sense, we still keep them. Um, and then we just run our usual regression. Um, there's two things that we should look out for. We have to standardize all the variables because lasso just takes them in their absolute values, where in a regression, that's not that's not really a problem. We just interpret it differently. So if it's in meters or in a kilometer, we just interpret the coefficient differently. But for lasso, the absolute values are actually important. Um, and then lasso tries this thing with a lot of different lambdas. So we can choose them how we want them. And usually the, the functions where we just run these lasso uh, things, they um, give out the lambda with the best prediction. But sometimes that's not really what you want because the higher this lambda gets, the more it tosses out variables. And that's kind of the whole point why we're doing this. So maybe the best lambda in terms of predictions is not going to be the best lambda to decide which variables we don't need. Yeah. I don't know, have you, have you worked with rich regressions? No, <laughs> no, I have not. I haven't really worked with any of them. Yeah. Because um, a lot of the time um, I'm working with, um, basically I'm working with data sets where um, I'm the models that I'm trying to use, I'm trying to reduce the number, I'm trying to reduce the number of um, parameters that need to be estimated because of the sample size of the data, but like without losing information. So usually what I do is I basically run the same model multiple different times with um, one of the parameters, which is like a pretty often, often just used as a constant. I run multiple iterations with like different constant values for that and then use something like AIC to just select from those. So I haven't really had to do much of this where you are actually sort of um, like testing the inclusion of different variables. Yeah. I feel like this is also somewhat new because it's more, I mean, it comes from machine learning and that's only gotten big in the last couple of years. So I feel like it's gonna still take a bit to tinkle into other um, fields. Yeah, but maybe just good to know about. Okay, we're at 59, so I'm gonna hit end.